And so uh, we don't know much about the ecology, except that we think that it's it's present in most birds, right? And so what what I would recommend at this point is anything that you can do with feed additives to knock down the the bacterial load in the environment is good. So there's many of these these uh, you know whether you think about uh, prebiotics probiotics, postbiotics uh, that have specific action against like gram positives, those would be good uh, feed additives to include. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host here today, Kelly Walmsley, and I'm joined by Dr. Tim Johnson. Hey, Tim. Hi, Kelly. Nice to meet you. Good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. So um, you're a professor in uh, the the vet school at University of Minnesota, and you've been there for um, some time now. And really, uh, you're m- microbiologist um, in in your specialty in in APEC E. coli specifically, right? That's correct. I've been at the University of Minnesota since 2007, so quite a while. <laughs> yeah, and so everybody knows you about um, APEC E. coli, and so um, I think that you're, um, you know, a, a renowned researcher in that area. And so, um, but we're going to kind of change gears and talk about something else today, right? Yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about a, a different bacteria that we've been studying that came up within the past couple of years, and it really started through conversations with with turkey vets who were talking about this bacteria Streptococcus gallolyticus that um, kept showing up in diagnostics uh, after after clinical disease, and typically it was a uh, what we call a sepsis, right? So a bloodborne infection, and it, it would end up in the organs and sometimes even get to the brain. And so that was really interesting oh, wow. because they hadn't seen that uh, before and and so we've been working a bit on that uh, ever since we found out about it. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. Is this something that was that they're seeing, you know, early on in a grow out, or just in the late stages, or throughout? Yeah, so it's it's quite interesting because it it seems like it varies a bit by place in the country where the birds are grown, right? So with turkeys in the U.S., we've got a lot up in the upper Midwest, and then we've got some in the southern part of the Midwestern U.S., uh, some in the south, and then some in the east, right? And depending on where you're at... None in uh, Mississippi, really. <laughs> <laughs> not too many in Mississippi, but, uh, but you know, you think of like Arkansas and, and Minnesota, North Carolina, those states, really. Right? Um, and... And, and so we've talked with all the companies. We actually have a stakeholder advisory group on this now, a workshop, a working group. And, and this group has said that it can range, you know, when these birds get sick, ranges from anywhere uh, from about three weeks of age up until, you know, maybe even eight to 10. So sometimes it's occurring in the the brood system. Sometimes it's occurring in the grow out barns. But typically it's kind of around the time be- right before they're being moved to right after they're being moved to the grow out facilities. And oh, it's okay. no component to it too, which is why I think it, that might have something to do with why you see different ages in, in different regions. Um, it seems like sure. cold, cold weather does has some kind of impact on the, the ability of the bacteria to cause disease, meaning that we tend to see the disease occurring in, in warmer um, times of the year, right? So there's definitely some kind of seasonality to this as well. Oh, that's interesting. And so is what are kind of typically the signs that if, if there are any that anyone's been able to pick up on right before um, kind of, you know, maybe a um, mortality or, or something that would occur? Is it, is, is it sub, is there some kind of sign of a subclinical infection and you see like a drop in feed intake or water intake, or is there any kind of other symptoms that are go, going on? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think 
we're, we're in the early stages of understanding this, but, but from what I understand, um, what got me interested in it too is because I've studied E. coli a lot and E. coli is a challenging one because, uh, if you go on any barn, you'll find E. coli, right? And you'll even find the pathogen, the bad forms of the E. coli. And no, but not all places have con- consistent problems with E. coli disease. And and so it's really an opportunist in, in that it finds the right place and the right time to cause disease. And with the strep, strep it's, it's kind of, it seems to be the same story, meaning we think that strep are probably everywhere. We know we find them in the the normal healthy respiratory tract of the turkey. Uh, and in terms of, of, of clinical presentation, it appears that for the most for most cases, you don't really have any subclinical uh, indications of disease. You might have you could have some depressed growth potentially. Uh, and and again, you know, much like E. coli, you you find birds that suddenly succumb with systemic disease, right? There is this neurological component to it, um, which doesn't occur all of the time, but sometimes it does. And with that, uh, there are some neurological symptoms sometimes, right? But again, that's not consistent. And that's really what got me interested in it was this idea that, well, if it's not consistent, maybe there's some strains of the, the streptococcus that are that are causing different types of disease than others. And that's what that's where this all started, really. Sure. So what are the steps that you all are taking in your lab to try to um, figure out where, you know, what the poultry producers can do? Yeah. So, so yeah, like you mentioned, I'm a microbiologist and, and um, a lot of the microbiology we do centers around understanding genomes and DNA. Right. And so, so when you have a disease like this with, with isolates that are essentially not characterized it uh the typical the typical way that we start to approach this is to to ask the question what where can we get uh these bacteria from and can we look at and find differences between especially with an opportunist like streptococcus uh, since it's out there all the time can we go get just the normal commensal isolates and look at them and can we also get as many representative isolates from clinical disease that we can. So the way, the way we approached it was to go out to this working group and ask them to try to collect isolates for us from as many different places and different disease presentations as possible, and then also to go out and see if they can find some from apparently healthy flocks. And and, and what we do then is we take all of those bacteria and we we get the DNA out of them and we put that DNA on a, a sequencing machine that we've got in Wilmer, Minnesota, which happens to be kind of the, the heart of turkey production in Minnesota. We have a, an applied lab out there that has a DNA sequencer. And so we'll take those isolates and get their DNA sequences. And that's where the, the fun really begins, because you look at the, the genetics of these bacteria and try to find what's different between them. Sure. And, and so... Um... It's it's really just kind of casting this broad ca- you know broad net out there, and then just kind of seeing if you can pick up on some of these similarities, and then and then you would look at um, from there you might be able to see are there cert- certain attributes that are you know similar to other bacteria, I guess, and then you know yeah. thinking about what's worked against those bacteria um, and in you know prevention or intervention, um, and then how it might help against this one right yeah i mean we we started with because uh strep pneumonia which causes pneumonia in humans is a well-known one so there's lots of information on that so our starting point was asking the question well what what are the virulence factors of of that bacteria and do we have similar ones in strep gallolyticus and what we found was that there's there's a couple that um are really unique to the to the cases that came from neurological disease. Uh, in particular, there's a what's called a bacterial capsule. Uh, so that's kind of the outer layer of the bacteria that protects it. There's one specific type that seems to be more present in the the, the nastier strains than, than the, the commensal strains. And then there's another virulence factor called an adhesin, which is well known as you know letting the bacteria attach to, to surfaces. And we found one unique one there 
that seems to also be present. So what we're doing now is we, we find this information and then we put it into an animal model to test it, right? So, so we actually have what's called embryo lethality assay, where we, we inoculate eggs with different strains of these, these streptococcus bacteria. And we try to determine if we can find correlations between certain genes and the ability for it to, to kill the embryo. Sure. That's fascinating. Um, it, it's completely opening up my eyes to a world that I didn't really understand on how to be able to kind of in the front end of being able to try to find out more about certain bacteria diseases uh, or disease causing bacteria. I always compare it to walking on the dark side of the moon. It's fun to look at the unknown, figure things out, right? So. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so it, do you think this is something that... Um, you know, chicken uh, people need to be worried about um, in in those specific areas, maybe, or some, or you know, something else. Yeah, at this point, it does not appear to have any impact on chickens. But uh, again, you know, these bacteria evolve quite often, um, and that's one thing about this one is that uh, it can interchange these traits pretty easily. Like strep is just a bacteria that can recombine quickly, right? So, so it may not. It's doesn't seem to be a problem in chickens and broilers now, but I would not say that it won't be a problem in the future because it seems to be an emerging pathogen for sure. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I guess, you know, um, it sounds like you guys are on a a great, you know, start to be able to try to figure, um, you know, figure out ways to help um, turkey producers with it. And, you know, hopefully um, if if there is a time where it moves over and we start seeing it with chickens or um, broilers, you know, that, you know, you might have some of these things kind of figured out or dialed in and maybe that will help. so I guess in thinking that, what would be um, nutritionists listening out there? What would be some things that they um, might want to think about on a prevention strategy and including um, some kind of alternative into the diet or additive? Yeah. Well, well, since we don't, we definitely don't have a vaccine for this yet, right? And so uh, we don't know much about the ecology, except that we think that it's it's present in most birds, right? And so what... What I would recommend at this point is anything that you can do with feed additives to knock down the the bacterial load in the environment is good. So there's many of these these uh, you know whether you think about uh, prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics uh, that have specific action against like gram positives. Those would be good uh, feed additives to include because there's they're always with these types of uh, diseases. There always seems to be a correlation between load in the environment and disease presentation. So if you can if you can control or knock down the load in the environment, you will have an impact on how many clinical cases you're seeing in the barn. So so when you we don't have specific targets like bad strains to go after, that's what I typically recommend is find something that has been shown to knock down that specific group of bacteria in the environment. Okay. Great. Well, I think that's uh, great um, information to leave people with uh, today. I really appreciate your time. Before we get completely out of this, I'm going to um, I kind of mix things up today. So I want to do um, a little bit of this or that. Um, so get rapid fire. All right. Uh, so football or baseball? Uh, football. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Aisle or window? Definitely aisle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then uh, Jackie Chan or Chuck Norris? Chuck Norris, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and then what poultry nutritionist would you bring with you in a zombie apocalypse and why? I would I would bring Sally Nolowitz. She's a retired nutritionist up in Minnesota. <laughs> And the, one other one one thing is because she knows a little bit about everything. But number two is she's a she's a good fisher, so we could go fishing <laughs> and we'd be, be successful. <laughs> Sally's a great choice. Uh, yeah, she would tear it up. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tim, um, and thank you all for listening in today. This has been another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Bye.